Welcome to Bronze and Modern Gods. Me llamo Juan. Me llamo Richard. Hi, everybody. Uh, international flair today. We've got <laughs> lots of stuff today. We've got a little review of Comic-Con Revolution. I went there this weekend. We have a little show and tell. We've got underrated books of the week. We've got viewer mail. Let's kick it off. But first, a word from our sponsor. You know it. You love it. It's Wakum. Wakum is the app for organizing your comic book collection. It's great for comic book readers. You can track what you own, what you've read, what to read next. All it takes is just one click on that UPC with your smartphone's camera. Do we call them smartphones? Is that like a, a granddad boomer way of referring to the uh, smartphones, right? Yeah, the smartphones. I think that's okay. it. Just click that UPC and bam, it's added to your collection. But what if it's an older book or a variant or something that doesn't have a UPC? Well, you could add whatever data you like, grade, page quality, whatever. What do you like to add, Richard? What are you reading? Uh, I like to add page quality. I think it's important to, to, to track that, especially in your collection. Whenever I can, I try to up upgrade the, the page quality in my collection. So it's always nice to know what I have. Slightly brittle. Uh, the best part, Wakum is free and it's got a little social media aspect to it. You can be, uh, follow people, your friends and other collectors on Wakum, see what they're reading, see what they're missing. If you like, you could follow Richard and I. I am at John underscore Hughes, just like the director on Wakum. And I'm Adult Kid Toys. Download Wakum from the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store for free today. Also, Richard, you take this one. Where are we going to be July 30th? We're going to be at Neo Comic Con. Uh, it's a great show here in North, North, on a Northern Ohio. Uh, our friend Eric from Comics Are Go is uh, the MC of the whole, whole affair. And it is a great place to be if you're in, into comic books here in, um, on the North Coast. They have a, a, a variety of different vendors. They're talking about over 120 booths and it is chock full of comic book dealers and now is the time you know i'm looking to the left and the right now is the time to pressure those comic book dealers for the best prices that you can get the market little is, teaser for my show and all, my show and all. <laughs> the market is soft it's a great time to be a collector because the books are out there and they are uh, at a reasonable price this is not 2020 and you can remind them of that if you feel you can get a better price but now, now, now's the time to buy, and uh, Neo Comic Con is uh, going to be probably the best opportunity here in uh, Northeast Ohio. You're burying the lead. We're going to be live streaming from Neo Comic Oh, yeah, Com that too. North Olmsted, Ohio. Uh, if you want to find out more, they you can check them out at, you got it, neocomiccon.com. That's neocomiccon.com. Uh, there's also going to be a bunch of artists there, including Stephen Butler, who I am a fan of. Stephen Butler, who co-created the Scarlet Spider, drew Sonic the Hedgehog and Silver Sable for years. We will see you there July 30th, North, North Olmsted, Ohio, at neocomiccon.com. Richard, your favorite hot book of the week. You picked it. No, you didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't. Uh, I Spider Spider-Man number seven, the second print. I picked this for a specific reason. I can't believe this is a thing. Again. I, I, well, I uh, uh, hey, it's selling for anywhere from $5 to $7 on eBay Raw right now. Came out Wednesday. There is a 1 in 25 variant that's selling for 60 bucks. I was at Comic-Con Revolution today here in Southern California. And this book was everywhere. And people were buying it. I didn't know if I was happy or if I wanted to jump off a bridge. Uh, this this feels so much like FOMO to me. Um, Spider Boy it feels, uh, I, and I, John and I were talking before the show, and and I said Spider Man, or the Spider Boy feels kind of like Punchline or or even worse, uh, Clown Hunter, Miracle you know? Molly, Miracle Molly. Yes, yeah, another <laughs> good one. Uh, you know, it's it's a character that's that's popular in the moment. But in six to twelve months, they're they're going to be um, they're not going to be an important character. To me, if you want to buy, if you're looking to speculate on this particular character, uh, as in speculating on most things, I would not buy when the hype is hot. That is not the time to buy. The time to buy is when the hype has been confirmed. So if six months from now, Spider Boy gets his own book, or Spider Boy shows up in 
you know, is rumored to show up in the next uh, Spider-Verse movie or some kind of co concrete example of why this character has some kind of value. I, well, I think that's what's happening. Uh, Dan Slott keeps teasing that this is going to be an um, quote unquote important character on his Twitter. And, you know, we might end up with egg on our face here because there's going to be a third printing now. That's fine. I, I still, I, I stand behind my feeling that now is not the time to buy. When the frenzy is is active, um, I would buy with, with, with the, you know, cooler heads when there's some kind of proof because look at James Tinian has, has claimed so many different things are going to happen. Or Mark Millar has claimed, oh, this particular character is going to be so important. And, you know, those have all panned out. I, I, I'm, I would rather put my dollars behind a proven horse than uh, something that is just rumors at this point. <sighs> Spider boy, we hardly knew ye. <laughs> yeah, we could be, you know, you know, in six months, I, you know, I may be eating crow and that's fine. But, uh, you know, buy it at cover. If you buy it for cover price, fine, you know, but, but don't, don't put any more hard earned money behind it until you know better. I have tons of Thor number sevens and uh, Venom number 25s to, to stand, to stand up to say these characters may not be what the, the authors claim them to be. Are you saying Codex is not going to? set the uh, comic book world on fire Is that what you're I, I don't think so at this point i kept seeing when that was out i kept seeing first appearance of codex and i'm like what's a codex is, it, is that seriously someone's name is that like we've run out of names yes it's <laughs> super villain number 17. first appearance of ascii <laughs> I don't know. Hey, we uh, mentioned it earlier. I was at Comic-Con Revolution today, Sunday, May 20th, 21st. So that was yesterday. Neat, neat how I time travel there on this podcast. That's, that's awesome. Um, interesting layout. We have a little video report here. Before I get into that, I do want to show some of the stuff I bought because I want to see Richard's reaction. Plus, I want to talk a little bit about the dealers as a whole. Richard, I was, I was bummed out. No one seems to have gotten the memo that it's not 2021 anymore. When really? it comes to pricing, so pricings board. were pretty gougy, uh, insane. And then there was a new thing that I did not like: not pricing your books on the wall or in the bins. And when you pick something out or you ask, I have to look that up. Hold on, and it wasn't one dealer; it was several dealers there today wow. that were doing this method. Now, I really want to think it's because they think that the market is soft and so they don't want to overcharge, but somehow there's a little part of me that suspects that is not the case. I walked away. If the book's not priced, I'm walking away. And and that's maybe a bad thing. That's just my gut reaction. I don't want to deal with it. Price your books, people. No, you know, or you can do it the other way. You you tell them the price you're willing to pay. Really? And, you know, if it falls within their purview, then maybe they'll they'll go ahead and sell it to you. But if they're not going to mark the book, then that tells me that there is some room for, for me to determine the price. Okay. And, you know, I could very easily look up on, you know, what's what it's selling for on eBay and then offer something 10% something less. You know, he takes it or leaves it. That's why this is a good show. The yin and yang, Richard and John. <laughs> John gets all fussy and stomps off. <laughs> Richard, like, he comes and gets the deals. The, uh, some great deals were to be had. I, my good buddy Ed Robertson was there. I love seeing his booth. He always, he's there for the love of collecting. He's not there to, to make a mint, and, and he had some great stuff. But let me show you. I, I, I spent some coin at a couple of booths, and I'll just show you what I got. You tell me what you think, okay? Okay. The Captain Adam charlton run continues so captain captain adam number 82 first appearance of nightshade i love the cover yeah there's a uh, good old nightshade there sorry i can't get that in there without covering my mic uh nightshade uh from the suicide squad you can see her there got a great deal on this i would say this is about 8.5 looks like it yeah i hope that's distributor ink and not color touch uh, it doesn't seem to go through the other side, so I don't think it's color touch, but that was good. Those, those books are hard to get, hard to get in high grade. Very hard. The Charles books are just cheap paper. 
the production values were not well it was it was a press used to make cereal boxes believe it or not <laughs> i believe it <laughs> yes uh i had no desire to buy this book in the past i had no desire to own it until i saw it and the minute i saw it i had to have it it is the first appearance of yogi bear oh and boo boo in comics four color comics number 1067 and so, so iconic that's awesome yeah it's got like a little dust shadow here in the corner but just structurally it's really awesome uh, and you know he's smarter than the average of bear i yeah. no desire to own the first i was actually on the hunt for something i've talked about on the podcast earlier um first roadrunner in comics first speedy gonzalez the looney tunes stuff mm -hmm. nobody had any looney tunes stuff but then i saw that yogi and i was like mm. nice I, do you think you can get rid of that dust shadow or you're not even going to try i don't know if i'm going to try i don't have that much into it i, I think it was like 120 bucks i paid 150 yeah. for that book uh uh i don't want to mess it up i'm happy i don't think i'm going to get it slabbed or anything it's not it's not like a thousand dollar book in 9.4 or anything like that so mm. Let's just let it let it be. <laughs> um, we have the Speed Carter Spaceman collection continues issue four with the awesome atomic oh. cloud cover. That is beautiful. It is nice. It's got you know very pressable defects. You see it in the middle there where there's a little like book length bend. It's not a it's not a subscription crease. I think something was resting on top of it. Mm -hmm. So that will press out nicely. It was graded at a 4.5. I think it's going to come back a five or so. Yeah, that's but a tough black cover. It looks nice. I think I need only three more and I have the run. Awesome. All right. And here are the two biggies. Uh oh. I'm just going to show you the first one. Tip top. Yeah. 188. I think that is the. First Peanuts cover with everybody. Oh, it. wow. Nice. Yeah. Drawn by Charles Schultz himself. And then there are stories in here, new original stories drawn by, written and drawn by uh, Schultz. Now, is that Lucy with the creepy eyes or Lucy with the... It's, it's interim Lucy, okay? See, okay. She, still, she still has something around her pupils, but it's not colored okay. white anymore. So it's, okay. it's interim non-nightmare Lucy. <laughs> All right, here's the biggie. I don't know if you're going to get the impact of this because you're not that into it, but hopefully uh, you can appreciate it anyway. And that is Tip Top 186. No, I'm not familiar with the... Uh, uh, for, uh, I think it's one of the earliest Peanuts covers. I think it's the third one outside of their self-titled one shot that you got for me uh last year mm -hmm. and i think charlie brown's on the cover of 185 and then this is 186 and what is great about this is i think this is like a 70 after oh, nice maybe a 75 this book just does not first of all it's super scarce mm -hmm. second of all it does not exist in grades above five i should have looked to see what the highest graded one it was but uh great. so give me context on where did you find them well, let's roll that beautiful bean footage and you'll find out. <laughs> it is Comic-Con Revolution in Ontario, California. This is a show we go to every year and here we are again. Uh, it is super busy. We're here on a Sunday. Yesterday I, was, uh, I heard that from a lot of dealers that it was super busy on Saturday as well. And we're going to go around and talk to a few people, see what's up. So let's hit the road. Jeff here from Bam Splat Pow. I know Jeff from Frank and Sons. Frank and Sons, yes. For people that aren't in Southern California, Frank and Sons is a huge collectible show. We've covered it on the show before. But what I like about Jeff's booth is, tell me about the oddball stuff, the Three Stooges in full color gold foil. Well, <laughs> you and I both appreciate obscure rarities and that's yeah. just an unusual book. So I bought it in a collection recently and thought I'd put it on the wall for people like you and me. Ten dollars. 
reasonable, right? Uh, very reasonable. And if you take a look uh, around here, Rafa, you're going to see all sorts of oddball stuff on the walls, along with a lot of keys. I mean, who else is going to bring a Time Bandits number one but Jeff? Sure, right, and put it on the wall I because know. there's an emotional attachment to these childhood memories that we want to acquire again, right? Uh, fantastic. And tell me, what do you collect, Jeff? I like Amazing Spider-Man. It's a blue chip stock for me. It, it never goes down. It never goes down. Not in the long term anyway. Right. And I'm, a, I'm in the long game. Do you have an AF-15? I do have an AF-15. Oh, what is it? What is it? It's a 2.5. What'd you pay for it? I paid 16500 last year, so I got it at a reasonable price. That is a good deal. You yeah. did not buy it at the absolute height. No, thank goodness. Thank but, goodness. again, as John Dolmayan has told me more than once, I only regret the comic books I didn't buy. Uh, I, I am a walking a testament to that, and I see Sonic Quest over here, I see Betty Page, I see Psycho from Innovation. I like an eclectic mix of properties that people can afford. So right now people are paying five, ten, and twenty dollars for books because that's what's manageable right now. You know, and but what's great is you've got all the oddball stuff unlocked, but you also have those Deadpool keys if people want that stuff. Sure, sure. Well, not I, me. Right now, I don't sell a lot of Deadpool uh, first appearances. I really? keep those for a while. Oh, okay. Because I'm looking forward to the next film, so oh, I want to. Smart. Yeah, I want to wait and, and then sell them off eventually. All right, Jeff, tell everybody where they can find you at Frankincense again. You can find me at booth 133 at Frankincense Collectibles. When you enter the room, I'm on the far left wall. Come and see us. You'll have a great time. I guarantee it. And you'll find stuff you're not going to find in any other booth. So. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. All right, good to see you, man. Good to see you. I am here now with the man, the myth, the legend, Terry from Terry's Comics. Hi, Terry. Hi. How's it going, John? <laughs> uh, you were telling me that uh, yesterday one, one was... quick correction, though. What? We're well, now Terry's <gasps> Old School Comics. Oh, snap. Did you see that? When did that happen? That's when I moved to Washington, ah. beginning of 2021. Nice. I, I have to agree with the name. This is why we come to Terry's booth, because... I was told, um, hey, do you sell stuff on Instagram? No. How about yeah. Facebook? Well, I have a Facebook page, but I don't sell. eBay? Yeah, I used to. Uh, how about your website? Can I order off your website? Well, I have stuff on the website, but you'd have to call me or send me an email in order to know if I actually have it, and then we'll do something over the phone or through email. It is quite and, literally old school. And I was told, <laughs> well, that's old school. I go, way to own it. I like that. Right. To be honest, yeah. I was the first guy to do barcoding that I know. I That I can attest to. They were absolutely Remember, right. Everybody's uh, watching. Will you take 150 for this? <laughs> Hell no. Everyone's watching. So you should be throwing big you money. You gave better out. deals to other people. <laughs> of course I do. We're, we're watching the, the man behind the red hood Everyone's versus Terry's only, old school scum. Only because Everyone's he gave know. me this booth. I mean, is this live? No. Oh, <laughs> it's going to be totally, trust me, it's going to be edited. Let me tell you what I like about your booth. And I think you know. You carry stuff, you bring stuff that no one else is going to bring to a show, correct? That's my plan. Yeah? Like, tell people what you specialize in. I specialize in anything you don't see at everybody else's booth. <laughs> Atlas Comics, Golden Age Comics, Good Girl Comics, uh, and Archie and Betty and Veronica from 1956. Terry's going to have it. I mean, look at it. He's got him on the wall there. Uh, today, I bought a few things from you. Why don't you walk with me through some of the stuff that I bought. For example, Speed Carter Space Man issue. Rob. <laughs> so what is that issue? If I had a kid, his name might, I might have named him Speed Carter just because it's a cool name. I don't have any kids though. But good nuclear yeah, explosion a, a going bomb on. bomb cover. It's happening, right? Yeah. Space animals. 
I love it. I'm what almost. They do? They're like Guardians of the Galaxy, only they're Sentinels. Are you saying this is a Guardians of the Galaxy prototype? And now that I sold it to you, no. Before I sold it to you, yes. <laughs> okay. I, this is. Uh, I think I need two more, and I'm think done with we'll, the run. Well, think about it, though. Yeah. Space Sentinels, Guardians of the Galaxy. Right. Look, they're out there, Guardians right. of the Galaxy. That we're being nuked, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> right. I bought a number one from you. Maybe 10 years ago, it came back a 7.5. Oh man, did I overgrade it or undergrade uh, you, it? You undergraded it and it was fantastic. So, Yeah, that's why I don't tell anybody old school. Exactly. And you can tell us about these two and why they're important. Well, these are yours now, but yeah. what you'll see is early, early uh, Peanuts covers before he had a TV show or a Christmas special or Thanksgiving special or The Great Pumpkin before uh, Woodstock or anything. You could see how cute Snoopy was back then. Look at him. Do you one. know the significance of... of the second or third issues. You, do you know the significance of both of these covers? Why they're really uh, desired by Peanuts fans? Because they're on the cover. It's actually Charles Schultz drawing them. Oh, I see. Uh, it's not a ghost or uh, anyone else. Charles no, I, Schultz I, I actually does. I I didn't realize that's why people want them. And uh, I know they're incredibly scarce. Right. This one... Uh, 186 is always mistakenly called the first solo Peanuts cover. No, it's it, not. It, correct. What? What is? Do you know? I've had it. Um, Peanuts number one. Oh yeah, that <laughs> did come out before this, didn't it? From United Feature yes. Syndicate. Yes, it got that. Well, that's a nice early one. That's beautiful. I mean, and it's got the whole gang. It's got everybody. Except in. for Peppermint Patty. Uh, well, she didn't come around. She'll come out later. Womp womp. Um, it also has Nightmare Original Lucy when she had pupils before, or when she had uh, whites around her eyes before they made it just pupils, which nice. is nightmarish. I'm a bit of a peanuts nut. I could tell. <laughs> Terry, tell everybody where they can see you next. You got a great deal here. By I way. did, by the way, uh, a fantastic deal. And we're going to Torpedo Show in July. I don't have the date or the location, but I know it's there. You can look it up, Torpedo comic show or con or convention glendale glendale thank you mm -hmm. you know the date nope but we'll it's be there weekend before san diego oh wow so it's july it would be july 12th i think then yeah. i'll and take your word for it is that the next show Who's interviewing who? i know <laughs> is that the next show or anything in between That's that my, no i'm doing two weeks from now i'll be hotel show denver okay uh, jim stranko will be there right two-day show Old, like my show, all old school comics, right. comic art, comic artists. Two weeks after that, there's a show at the uh, Washington State Fairgrounds in Puyallup, Washington. Nice. It's a little bit east of Tacoma. Okay. That's kind of a more like this and everything show, but it's a good show. All right, so uh, make sure you are subscribed to Terry's email list, which even though it's Terry's old school comics, the email list is at terryscomics.com. Terryscomics.com. Thanks, and, Terry. And if you want to order off the website, it, it ain't going to happen. Because <laughs> he's old school. <laughs> so there you go, uh, Terry, hooking me up with some uh, Peanuts books. And, uh, you know, without giving away any trade secrets, he really was uh, a great dealer to work with, gave me a great deal and awesome. super happy. Super happy. Could have bought that new um, combo microwave oven for the kitchen. But <laughs> who cooks? <laughs> Rub hub all the way. Time for everyone's favorite segment, viewer mail. You've got mail. I can start off, Richard, okay. uh, from our email at bronzeandmoderngods at gmail.com. This comes from Three Rivers Comics. Hi, John and Richard. Hope you are well, Richard. Thank you. I'm doing great. I think I'm okay, too. Uh, I need your expertise. I recently bought an original collection of Bronze Age X-Men in high grade from my LCS who took them in on trade. They sold them to me quickly after they got them in. When I inspected the books, I found over a dozen signed by Dave Cockrum on the first page. Wow. Old school. Dave died in 2006. Hard to find signature. Good lesson. Always check your books. Yeah. How do I best resell these and get them out to the community plus get a good price as I am a reseller? Would collectors want a slab for verification purposes like CBCS offers? The downside is once it's slab, you won't see the SIG. Mm -hmm. Send it to CGC and request blue label with the note. Same downside. Selling them raw doesn't seem to get a good price as they are basically a flawed book due to an unverified signature. 
appreciate your thoughts. Share this show on in viewer mail if you like. Oh, we were going to do it anyway. Uh, <laughs> you, three reverse comics. Thank you, three reverse. Um, here's my take. CBCS is kind of the way to go. I have my issues with their verification because has all right, honest question to everybody. Please tell us in the comments. Has anyone ever sent a signature in to CBCS where they said, nope, we can't verify this and they sent it back? Good point. Has that ever happened? Good point. So nothing is a hundred percent, you know, if if every single book they've they've had submitted gets slabbed then there's probably a problem there. I, I'd love to be wrong. Tell me if I'm wrong. Um, having said that, if you're going to resell them, and it sounds like you are, which pains me in my heart, because um, why not keep them? But you're a reseller. Okay. You have three reverse comics. You would want to slap them with CBCS and get them SIG verified. That's the way to best maximize the price you're going to get for these. Yeah, uh, I, I see. That look, mm -hmm. I see that look in your eyes. What's up? Oh, this, this to me, this feels to me like the perfect opportunity to post these books up on CGC forums. The, to me, this is a this is the uh, the kind of book that those forums seem to do really, you know, really well on those forums. Uh, post the book, sell it raw. Just, post a picture of the SIG in the book along with the listing and you, they will sell. I can almost guarantee you they will sell. Now, if you're looking for the maximum amount of money that you're going to get, then John's John's route is probably going to get it. It's going to take longer, in my opinion, to sell because you're targeting a, a, a smaller niche audience. But the CGC folks aren't as concerned about slabbed books as, um, your run of the mill collector. I, I I love those guys. Anybody who's on the CGC forum, uh, props to you because those are those are some great collectors. They also have a great community for selling books, and I think this kind of th those kinds of books are uh, a perfect thing to sell on those forums. And you also have to test your appetite for the slabbing and shipping fees that you're going to incur. Good point. To get, to get the books slabbed. Um, didn't say what you do say in high grade might be worth it if you're pressing and cleaning them and you think they're going to get nine, four, nine, six. But yeah. if we're talking eight, five, nine O's, Richard's probably right. Sell them raw on the CGC, CGC forums. It's a good point. If, if you got a slam dunk nine, eight, nine, six, I'd slab it. But other than that, I think the forums are going to be your best bet. All right. Good luck, Richard. What do you have? My first piece of viewer mail is from Richard Underwood. Um, and this came from our bronze and uh, modern gods email account. Uh, hi, I was pleasantly surprised to see the UK fantastic number one comic appear on your show. Back in the late 60s and early 70s, yes, I am that old, uh, buying US comics in the UK uh, was based purely on what individual news agents were selling at the time with no rhyme or reason. I had an inordinate, inordinate number of House of Mystery slash Secrets and Charlton Ghost books. Fantastic and its sister comic Terrific were one example of reliable reprints. A more random source were the Allen class comics, amazing stories, astounding stories, etc. 64 page black and white reprints in no particular order of everything from Gold Key stories to Kirby Ditko stories to Marvel superheroes. Wow. Uh, these coverings are surprisingly collectible. Sinister number 23 reprinting the first Iron Man story recently sold for 320 pounds. Uh, excellent show as always. Thank you very much. Regards, Richard. I always love when people share their personal experience with books. And I really, really feel that um, UK books are undervalued right now. And at some point, the the, the collecting and uh, hobby is going to realize that these books are first appearances of these major characters and are going to start flocking to them. So um it's amazing. I, I didn't know what the comic book um, market was like in England in the 60s and 70s. And um, I could see how these reprints were really just a godsend and being able to get uh, stories from uh, the U.S. When I was in the U.K. last summer, we uh, stopped at Gosh Comics in Soho, I believe. And down in the basement in the back issues, Gary Leach, who drew Miracle Man. Yeah. Beginning. 
he had recently passed away and he had, I guess, his estate or someone sold his entire collection of Allen class reprints and they had boxes and boxes of them. And that's when I came back with a whole slew of them last year. Those things are nuts because you'll have like amazing Spider-Man number seven on the cover with the you know, first appearance of uh, Electro, I think. And inside, you know, you've got some Charlton stories thrown in there and weird gold key stuff. It, whatever he got the right to, he just jammed them in there. Uh, those books were always for decades seen as like junk. And now I think they're finally having their day. So it's, it's pretty cool to see. My next piece of viewer mail also comes from bronze and modern gods at gmail.com from Michael N Atlanta. Is that your real name? <laughs> Hi, John and Richard. I'm a subscriber to your YouTube and I really appreciate how you educate your audience through experience, banter, and kindness. Aw. Oh, thank you. I have you. a question that hopefully you can provide some guidance. I'm looking to purchase a 9.8 comic slab as an investment only. Okay, that's key here. Uh -huh. the slab has a Newton ring on the front cover. Therefore, should I not considering purchasing this book because of, of the Newton ring? This caused apprehension of a prospective buyer in the future. Thank you for your time, Michael N. Atlanta. Michael, first of all, for everybody that does not know what a Newton ring is, that is when CGC has a slab that they have done where there's like an oily appearance on the front because the two plastics are touching. Something happens to create what looks like a little oil slick. Some people hate, 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 hate hate newton rings i am not one of those people i i'm buying the book right uh caveat i've seen some crazy out of control wacky newton rings where it looks like the exxon valdez just exploded <laughs> yeah i get that there's like i think a, a a marvel spotlight number five first ghost writer that somebody always posts as an example that's just covered with newton rings that's obnoxious having said that um some people really have a problem with it. I, I would say, how bad is the Newton ring? Is it a little <laughs> Newton ring? Like they're just covering up a nondescript part of the cover? Uh, is it a big blotch over the character's face? I think that has a lot to do with it. Um, there are ways of removing Newton rings. Nothing is 100%, but you know, do some quick Googling and you can see there's a couple little suction cups you can buy at right. Home Depot and just kind of pull the book a little bit things to separate them a bit there's a way to use a mylar bag and shimmy it in between and, and break up that that oily look but i don't know it this it, i michael i want to give you more definitive uh responses but we'd have to know what book it is how bad the newton ring is how long you were planning on keeping it stuff like that but yeah. frankly a newton rings don't bother me they don't bother me either i have a few books that have newton rings um, and as John says, you buy the book, not necessarily the slab. Um, there are, there are like, and as John mentioned as well, there are a number of ways that people have claimed to be able to remove them of using suction to, to pull apart those two pieces of plastic that are uh, interacting with each other. But I wouldn't let it stop me from buying a book. I would, you know, maybe use it the other way, you know, claim that you have a problem with the Newton rings and maybe get another 10% off the book. And, you know, well, you know, I'd really like to buy it, but the Newton rings are kind of a problem. And then maybe they'll give you a discount. Frankly, it doesn't bother me. And I don't think it bothers enough people that you would have difficulty selling it. Just be upfront. You know, if you're going to sell it, take pictures of the book so that people see it so you don't get people complaining afterwards, but just be upfront. You know, this book has Newton rings and uh, here they are and here's my price for it. And I think you, know, you won't have a problem selling most books. Great point because I have uh, heard of people getting books uh, after an auction and then saying, well, it has a Newton ring. I need uh, an additional $50 off or I'm going to leave bad feedback. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, those scumbags, don't give them the chance. Make sure you tell them all about the Newton rings. And you can say, uh, Newton ring is not an excuse to return the book. Uh, there, no return on slab copies, stuff like that. Yeah. What's your next piece? My next piece of your mail is from Ali uh, Gavatos. Um, they're talking about st uh, storing comic books. I personally go, uh, I'd personally go to the storage storage unit route uh, for my larger collection, and I love it. Climate control facilities with one, an outer fence, and two, 
cameras inside have an extremely low breaking rate and you can feel safe keeping your books there. I recommend drawer boxes in the unit uh, makes pulling books out uh, and series super easy. Uh, that's something else we haven't really talked about is the, the, the drawer boxes, but I swear by them. It's all I use. Yeah, that's they are, They are awesome. They are expensive and difficult to ship, but they are worth it. Um, as those who don't know, drawer boxes are basically a supercharged version of a paper uh, long box or short box. And uh, they they have a removable cardboard drawer that you can pull out of the main unit and be able to store your books in it. And they're they're nice because they're easy to stack. I love them for uh, for slabs, and I also have them for you know for regular comics as well. But they're they're excellent things. If you look if you if you go through your collection on a regular basis, they are great. Um, yeah, and thank you for for commenting on on uh, the the things that you look for in a storage facility. The uh, an outer fence and cameras, are, I think, are important. Um, and also having a low breaking rate. It, it never nothing's going to ever be a hundred percent safe um, unless you put it in your in, in in a bank vault, which you know you know we may do that for your key key books. Um, I don't think I would put an AF fifteen in a storage facility, for example. But, you know, if for a majority of your collection, I think a storage facility still is a great way of uh, keeping your collection safe, uh, protected, and more importantly, away from your spouse. <laughs> there you go. Uh, hmm. My next piece of your email is also from our email address at bronzemoderngods at gmail.com. This comes from Jonathan in Virginia. Is that your real name? <laughs> uh, any idea why Gold Key and Dell did not stamp the comics code on their covers, especially in an era when Marvel and DC had stamps the size of a quarter front and center on their covers? Thanks, Jonathan from Alexandria, Virginia. Yes, Jonathan, Gold Key and Dell prided themselves on being pure comics that were safe for kids always from the very beginning. So they felt they were, frankly, above the comics code. We don't have any reason to put the comics code or pay a fee to be part of the comics code authority because unlike evil marvel atlas at the time or even dc we've never published a horror or mystery comic or anything gory or anything slightly objectionable object, objectionable our life has been 100 percent disney looney tunes you name it so yeah they felt they were above the comics code they weren't going to do it and they got away with it I got no one stopped them. I mean, you also, I think they controlled a lot of the distribution. So I don't think anyone was going to get in their way. And mm -hmm. keep in mind, Dell Comics and Gold Key Comics, when you're looking at sales in the 50s, Dell and Gold Key are here. Here's DC, <laughs> here's Atlas and Marvel, and here's everybody else. Dell was king. I think Walt Disney Comics and Stories had millions of copies at one point. Uh, per month being sold. So they had a lot of weight to throw around. So they were going to sully themselves with some disgusting comic codes. <laughs> what do you got? My next piece is from Timothy Markin. Hi, Tim. Uh, this is, an, again, talking about storing comics. Uh, I wish I had 45 long boxes. My, our mutual friend Evan has a collection of about 45 boxes. Mm -hmm. Uh, my collection is over 120 long boxes, along with more than 600 digests, countless graphic novels, treasuries at all. I've I've tried weeding them out, weeding out the unwanted comics, but it's too tough. I've got complete runs of obscure stuff like Nervous Rex, for example, that I never get rid of. Too attached. And I spent last year completing runs of 50s Dell comics. With no so, stamps. The stamps. So the collection is ever expanding, even while dumping books. Um, and and about Starlog, one of my favorite books from growing up. I love Starlog. I waited every month for that book to come out. A local toy and comic store had issues of Starlog at one dollar each, going back to number one. Ah, I purchased about the first three years worth. A lot of Star Trek and Space 1999 articles. Yes. And they were really promoting Star Wars too. Fun nostalgia. Yes, I'm so surprised that Starlog books are not going, are not 
higher value than they are, given that I must not be the only person, as obviously by Timothy here, who has uh, a memory of those books from from childhood. But uh, great, great, great books. If you're in, if you're into science fiction, movie making, um, TV shows, and pop culture around it, uh, Star Logs are a great way to get a zeitgeist of what was going on back in the days. If you want to pick up a copy, I didn't used to buy Star Log. I used to buy the Star Log episode guides, which were kind oh, of oh yeah, yeah. Remember those? They were like graphic mm-hmm. novel kind of uh, format, and they would do episode guides of TV shows. You know. Uh, a, a quick recap of every episode's plot and who was the guest star and who wrote and directed it. Right. And there was one I bought, like I bought it for Doctor Who. I think I had Doctor Who on it, but it also included an episode guide for The Star Lost. And oh. The Star Lost, for people who don't know, was a Canadian produced science fiction show that was syndicated in the US in 1973. I think it lasted 14 weeks before it got unceremoniously dumped. For some reason, the episode guide that for the Star Lost just fascinated me. I was like, oh, they're trapped on this spaceship that's like a new Earth and they're lost and they yeah. can't find where they're going. And it sounded great. And I'm like, I wish I could see the show. It looks like it's going to be fantastic. Then YouTube came along and I finally get to see the Star Lost. What a piece of crap. Yeah, I, I remember seeing it. Um, and I remember that, that that episode guide you're talking about. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, it wasn't that good. Star Lost, Chroma Key. They could have just called the show Chroma Key. Everything was Chroma Key. There was an episode with like giant bees, and it was literally them standing in front of a Chroma Key screen where they would just project stock footage of bees, like blown up. But that's classic. That's classic. Oh, it The stories weren't that good. Harlan Ellison had his name taken off of it. So. Oh, well. Yeah, take that. Uh, My next piece and my last piece of email is from Michael uh, Praley. The inappropriate, uh, we're talking about um, Terra, first appearance of Terra, which you talked about in Teen Titans last week and the uh, Deathstroke relationship. The inappropriate uh, Terra Slade relationship was dealt with nicely in John Ridley's excellent The Other History of the DC Universe. Deathstroke is called out as being manipulative, manipulative and a rapist. Oh. DC did the right thing by addressing this relationship, even if it was decades later. Good to know, Michael. I had no idea. I have that book sitting right here. I've never read it. Um, maybe I should crack it open one time yeah. and see how they dealt with it. But uh, yeah, I, that's interesting that they went head on with it. I thought that was just going to be like, la, 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 we don't know. I I think because, you know, Deathstroke is such an important character, um, they had to do something. They had to, they had to uh, speak out about it. Um, and, you know, that, that opens him up to be used in the future um, with at least some closure to this, to this particular issue. Uh, and Tara is, I think is Tara, as far as the Teen Titans goes, uh, such a great character. I, I just, I would love to see, and they, they did, they did her okay in the Teen Titans uh, TV show. Uh, I would love to see a better, a better exploration of that storyline in the future. Well, fingers crossed. What is your last piece of your mail? My last piece is from uh, John Doe 297. Is that your real name? <laughs> Has there always been background music or am I am i just now hearing it uh john can you did elaborate you, on that did you hear the background music last I week i did i heard it i heard it last week and i forgot to uh bring it up to you i thought it was cool um yeah just experimenting uh that's all uh, it, last week we put some background music behind I, I i always try to learn one new thing each week when i'm editing and doing this and you kind of see it uh, hopefully between uh april 2020 and may 2023 uh i i think we've grown by leaps and bounds in terms of production values i still have to a few things to learn but yeah you know when we're doing sponsored um uh sponsors it we can talk or we can have something interesting going on underneath it so i thought it was good to bring in and then just slowly weave it out yeah i I love the way it was applied i thought it was great I could never imagine doing a show like this 25 years ago. Yeah, 25 years old. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I just I just blast by the segues now. I'm not going to yes. spend a lot of time ruminating on it today. The 25 year rule, new people. Hi, 25 year rule is when we talk about the year nostalgia kicks in when you try to regain your childhood. It usually kicks in after about 25 years. In this case, we're going back 25 years to 1998 for a Marvel book that was co-published by Paramount Studios. Do you remember that collaboration? No, I don't. They partnered with Paramount to do Star Trek books and Mission Impossible by Rob Liefeld. Um, they would have Star Trek, The Next Generation meets the X-Men. Yeah, I was about to ask about that. Was that a part of no. that? This was part of it. The Mighty Heroes number one. Do you remember the Mighty Heroes cartoon from the 60s? No, I Me don't. neither. I, I don't think it was ever syndicated by the time you and I were coming up. I had never heard nor seen this comic book from 1998 before. It's a Marvel Comics release under the short-lived partnership with Paramount. These characters, the Mighty Heroes, were originally created by Terry Toons, who you might know from Mighty Mouse and Heckle and Jekyll. This was a double-sized one-shot featuring these characters from the 1960s cartoon of the same name, written by Scott Lobdell. I'll do anything for a check. <laughs> Retailers ordered a whopping 8,292 copies of this book. This book now sells between $5 and $20 raw on eBay. To me, Richard, this book has the scent of trademark preservation comics all over it. Definitely a Marvel oddball book, so it speaks to me in some strange way. It sure is. This definitely falls into your, your uh, purview. But I have to wonder if that was a, kind of a smart move by Paramount. We need to keep this copyright we need to keep this trademark we can't do a new cartoon it's too expensive oh wait we've got this partnership with marvel we'll just have them put it out and use the logo and use the characters on the cover and name them all trademark preserved for another 35 years hmm. yeah yes it's not the first time we've done that it makes me want to start a new comic book company just called trademark preservations comics <laughs> tpc yeah We'll just go to the studios and say, hey, we'll produce the book for you. You just license it to us for free and we'll give you a little cut of the revenue and your trademark is preserved. It makes me wonder how many Golden Age characters um, are out there in limbo. Oh, waiting to be resurrected. And um, you know what I mean? There's especially around the war period, there was just a slew of of Nazi fighting uh, mm -hmm. heroes. And, you know, maybe it's not Nazis they fight anymore, but but some other uh, other force. And it'd be interesting to see somebody bring those characters back. You have some people like Big Bang Comics, I think, and uh, Amera Comics that do Femme Force. They, mm -hmm. They'll just publish public domain stuff all the time, the stuff they feel has fallen into the public domain. Mm -hmm. And I believe, um, you guys tell me if I'm wrong, I believe like Ron Friends and Tom DeFalco took some public domain characters and started doing new stuff with them with another publisher i may have the creative team wrong but yeah the people are always raiding those public domain characters i think it's a good thing yeah time for the underrated books of the week richard you and j scott campbell you can't you can't I, quit him can you? i can't quit him i'm sorry he i know he's not good for me but he's my <laughs> bae you can change him <laughs> I can change him. Uh, my my pick this week is uh, uh, obviously a J. Scott Campbell uh, cover book. It's Gwenpool Holiday Special Number One, and this is uh, I'm talking specifically about the uh, variant cover that he sold on his white website. He has his own website, jscottcampbell.com, um, where he sells um, books that are only available on his website. Um, He'll sell like one of the big books that he did was Black Cat number one when it came out. And he did seven different covers of which they were all exclusive to his website. And uh, out of those seven covers for that book, at least three are $800 plus books nowadays. Wow. There's, there's the um, uh, Chat Noir um, cover book, which is a $1,500 book. There are a couple of Mary Jane's and Spider-Man uh, covers that are about $800. And there may even be more out of that group. It's, 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 it's one of those things that he has such a strong fan base that 
he produces less material than the demand is. And that is always a good thing for people who are looking to find value in comic books. So, you know, those, those runs run from a thousand copies, uh, 1500,000 books a cop, uh, a run. Uh, one of the books that he did was this, the Squid Put Hall Holiday Special. And this book is a, a quirky book. Um, it's got a lot of cameos and guest stars in it. You've got a whole bunch of, um, Avengers like Ms. Marvel, um, Miles Morales, Jane Foster, um, Sam Wilson as Cap and, and, and Tony Stark. So you got a, a whole bunch of characters that come in and out of the book. Um, this is one of those books that has always kind of skirted attention. Uh, you can find this book for $10, $20 uh, up on eBay right now. And um, I, I really like, you know, I, I try not to think of books only as speculative tools. Um, but to me, this, this book feels really good in that I can buy this book for 10, 20 bucks. And if, you know, at some point, I mean, Ryan Reynolds, who's doing Deadpool right now, Ryan Reynolds also just sold his company for over a billion dollars. Uh, he had a, he had a wireless, uh, cell phone. Oh, company. Trust me. It's called mint mobile. And I can't watch YouTube without seeing 9,000 ads with his <laughs> mug. Well, you know, he sold that company and he's now got enough money that Marvel money is no longer, to me, would no longer be of interest. Can he so, stop doing commercials? Did he? Can he? Now that he has the money, can he just stop? <laughs> please? Well, my point is at some point he's going to tire of doing Deadpool. And I think Deadpool as a character is a is a great franchise of all the Marvel movies that are out on in in recent memory. I think uh, Deadpool has has a strong following. Some of the real more recent movies in the MCU may not have as uh, has been as successful as the Deadpool run. So when he stops playing Deadpool, you're not going to get another Deadpool to continue on with the franchise. I could see them bringing on a female Deadpool, and that could easily be Gwenpool. Uh, you think Gwenpool is going to replace Ryan Reynolds? I, I, you know, I'm not talking about the next movie, but I'm saying that if if you had to have another character who was tongue in cheek, uh, who can skirt the violence <laughs> limitations on violence like Deadpool has, you know, it's not going to be it's not going to be the other fourth wall breaking characters like She Hulk. I think it'd be it'd be Gwenpool. Gwenpool is as violent as as uh, Deadpool is. And has no encumbrances that uh, She Hulk has. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm, it's, it could be on, it's uh, out of left field, but I, I like it. I would watch that movie. I, I could, you know, in five years, if Ryan Reynolds decides he's not doing Deadpool anymore, I would love to see uh, a Gwenpool movie. Melissa McCarthy is Gwenpool. God. no please no <laughs> please no you know seriously you know who would actually be really good as Gwenpool and I think could pull it off and is young and and has a quirky uh sense of humor um Sarah Sherman from SNL do you know who she is she's Sarah Squirm when she used to do stand-up she's the she's one of the new cast members on SNL that okay uh, very uh she's the one with the mullet um she played Jewish Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been bad about watching SNL the last couple of seasons. If it's not Weekend Update, I haven't really seen it. <laughs> She's the one that always rags on Colin Jost during Weekend Update. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. okay. So, uh, yes, uh, I'm putting my my flag down for Shara, Sarah Sherman as Gwen Poole. Yeah, I, you need somebody young because you want to get at least three movies out of them. Um, but it'll be fun. I think about it, you know. I was, the the whole premise for Deadpool already is um, incredulity in yeah. a comic book universe. You know, you got the comic book universe, and then you've got Deadpool layered on top of that. Um, why not just take that one extra step, and you've got uh, a whole um, you know character to build on? I need 10% Sarah Sherman. That is my agent's <laughs> fee for getting you this part. Uh, my underrated book of the week. Uh, speaking of quirky and funny and bizarre, is this thing, The Shadow, number 19. Okay. it's It's got uh, ASM Rhino vibes going there. Do you see what's happening on this cover? 
This is the census shattering shadow. His head is on a giant robot body. It's got Marvel hype from the 60s all around it. Yeah, that's the shadow? That's the shadow. This is the last issue of the late 1980s series, which came on the heels of Howard Chaykin's deluxe format miniseries. Mm -hmm. It was by Andy Helfer and Kyle Baker. Kyle Baker, the amazing Kyle Baker. Started out as a straight ahead updating of the shadow for the 1980s. A little more violence, a little more sex. But after six issues drawn by Bill Sienkiewicz, Bill takes a hike as he does. Kyle Baker comes in and it quickly goes off the rails in the best way. <laughs> it really becomes a black comedy, uh, the darkest humor. Um, just a few examples. Uh, I believe a gorilla rips the head off the shadow. He becomes decapitated. I believe a gorilla does it. Um, his sons then attempt to take his body to a temple to revive him. You know, in the Andes, they're climbing a mountain. The shadow's body tumbles down the mountain after uh, some mishaps and gets completely mutilated and destroyed. So the shadow's head ends up on this ridiculous robot body. <laughs> and that was the cliffhanger because while I loved it, other critics loved it. Condé Nast, who owns the shadow, were not amused. In fact, downright appalled when they saw what was happening to their precious character, getting the living bejesus kicked out of a monthly by uh, Helfer and Baker. The book was immediately canceled. Oh, and wow. literally in the middle of a, a, a seven part story, this is part six, it didn't come back. They were promised, they promised for months to have a concluding special, never happened. But what did happen just a few months later the Shadow is relaunched as The Shadow Strikes, written by Gerard Jones, taking place in the 30s. It was everyone's nice, boring shadow back on the stands. <laughs> well, that's what you expect from The Shadow. Yeah, so that ran for three years. A uh, little more successful. But could you imagine you license your character out to a comic book company and, you know, they start off like, yeah, you know, here's the shadow for the 80s. It's mm -hmm. we're updating him. We're bringing him up to date. And so you're like, okay, they're doing a good job. You turn your head, you go back and you pick up your, your stack of free books to review from DC and you see this. <laughs> <laughs> Can you blame them? I loved it. It is bonkers in the best sense. Um, I thought this was something that was never, ever going to be allowed to be reprinted. However, um, I believe Dynamite collected it all in oh, really? a hard collection a few years ago. Hmm. So God bless you, Condé Nast, for having a sense of humor a few decades after the fact. Too bad they couldn't let uh, issue 20 come out. I wonder if there was art that still exists. I'd love to see what was done uh, because it does end on a cliffhanger. Uh, and we never got resolution. So mm -hmm. there you go. Uh, anybody else out there besides me love this series? It, I can see why shadow purists, especially pulp collectors, were aghast and like, what the hell is this? I was, I didn't give two spits about the shadow. So I was like, oh, this is great. <laughs> really sticking it to these people. Yeah, it, was, it was Cap and they had Cap uh, doing something inappropriate for Cap. Heroes Reborn is what it was called. Oh, <laughs> I've been there. Done that. You've, uh, you've, you've, yeah, you've uh, borne that cross. Huh? I have survived that era. How's that for a show? The Shadow, Peanuts, Gwenpool. All over the place. Yeah. All over the place. A Spider Boy. Don't forget to buy your Spider Boy third prints. Go to your comic shop now and special order them. Uh, it's okay <laughs> if you don't. I, I if, if I can buy it for cover price, buy it. But anything more than that, I would I would hesitate. Before you go on to Previews World and place your order for a crate of Spider Boy <laughs> third prints, <laughs> take a moment to like us on Facebook and Instagram and follow us and hit like on this video on YouTube if you're watching it there. Subscribe if you haven't already. It really helps us out. Thanks, Richard. Thanks. I'll trade you my crate of, of uh, Venom number 25s for your crate of Spider Boys. And on that day. Hold on a second. I will trade your crate of Venom 25 for my crate of Thor number sevens. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's an even swap, don't you? I think so. What was issue did uh, Clown Hunter come out in? I would... 
Batman 91, I think. Was that it? Like that. Um, Well, I have a crate of Batman 108. Miracle Molly is just sitting Mm -hmm. here ready to be distributed like ecstasy at a rave. I tell you, caveat emptor. That's that's all I have to say. Buyer beware. And on that happy note, we'll see you next time. Stay safe.